Hi, my name is Dave. Today we're going to look at a very unusual telescope. Uh, this is a Coudé telescope. I could maybe get away with calling it a Zeiss Coudé because it does have a Zeiss objective. <laughs> but it's not really the same as a full-fledged Zeiss telescope. Um, let me show you a little bit about how this scope looks. I think you'll agree it's rather unusual. It's a Coudé telescope, which was invented by a Frenchman in the late 1800s named Loewy. The word Coudé in French means elbow. Um, and it's a telescope that moves. The eyepiece stays in one location, and the telescope moves all over the place. It's an equatorial telescope, and I think you can see that. I'll be showing you a little bit more about the motions here. Let me show you. Right now I'm going to unlock it and show you how it moves. That's declination. That's right ascension. It does feature both right ascension and declination slow motion. This is the right ascension. Let's see, I have to lock it down to show you that. There's right ascension. Uh, the lock down here, bring it around so you can see it. This lock is right here, and now it's got declination slow motion. Uh, I tried mounting this scope without the declination slow motion. It was very, very difficult to use. It's uh, a bit of a challenge at, say, uh, well, even 20 or 25 power, low power. Without the declination, it's very difficult to get something centered. Uh, you kind of don't know which way you're going with this thing. What you see through the eyepiece doesn't intuitively match the motions that you see on the mount. So it's, that's one of the tricky things about this. Well, let me give you a more close-up look at this and explain some more details. Just a little... Okay, here's a little closer look at some of the features on this scope. This is about a four pound counterweight. Now, this is a 50 millimeter telescope in here. A little short, 50 millimeter by 540 telescope. It's pretty darn short. Normally, it would be a very small and would require almost no counterweight, depending on the mount. But uh, it's got a huge, big four pound counterweight over here. This is about a one pound counterweight here on the tail. So it's got a lot of counterweight going on. Uh, this telescope is designed to be used in a seated position, at least with the tabletop mount, like so. This is the eyepiece. So this thing is now uh, usable. So I'm now ostensibly using it. I can uh, lock it down in various positions. Like so. Okay, so now I've got it locked on an object. I have my slow motion, right ascension, declination. Nice. Uh, what if you have something that's really low? Let's adjust this camera just a bit. Something uh, that's kind of, you can see that's pretty darn low on the horizon. Um, you can easily get to something over on this side that's right on the horizon if you want to. But in order to get to some positions over here, you may have to reverse the mount. This is not uncommon with German equatorials anyway. Uh, so let's just reverse this. And I found through experience that it's pretty... not a bad idea to do that. Aim that at the pole. Uh, loosen it up. Notice how this gooseneck just barely allows the counterweight. Uh-oh. Won't allow that to clear. This is going to have to be removed anyway. It would be a very inconvenient position over there. So you flip that over there. So it's going to be up here. You have to do that with these, this kind of mount anyway all the time. So now I've got my right ascension here. Um, now the telescope is totally wrong. Well, you're going to have to 
I suppose let's go back to this position over here. You want to look at something like that. You could probably get away with this, but it's more convenient. Just move this around over here. So let's lock it down. Now you've got something that you can uh, have access to the sky over there. And you can pretty much access most any location, most any place in the sky. Uh, unless your ears are really big. <laughs> anyway, uh, you can get to the Pole Star, probably, if you want to. And you can access uh, most anything in the sky with this mount. Let's compare this uh, very interesting Coudé mount with a little, simple, inexpensive Mead ETX. This is a, an old ETX from the 90s. The eyepiece on this scope does move around, but it doesn't go very far. And as a matter of fact, especially if you're looking at something on the ecliptic, say uh, a planet, it's not going to really go very far at all. And the convenience of having this absolutely stationary uh, seems to be uh, kind of a moot point here. So is this stationary eyepiece really that big a deal? Uh, especially in a, in a 50 millimeter scope, uh, it's, frankly, it's absurd. Uh, but it's, uh, it's kind of fun, kind of interesting to look at, isn't it? When I started this project, I was attempting, or I, what I wanted to do was to make a working model of this. This is a Zeiss Coudé refractor. I uh, had read a a, a bunch of posts on uh, cloudy nights about restoring a six inch Coudet refractor, wonderful thread. Anyway, uh, Peter Saravolo did that and it was just charming. I, I just drooled about that telescope and I thought, well, I can't build a full six inch, but I can make a one inch. That's what I thought. Now, I don't know if you can see the scale on this thing. That's a one inch there. It turns out that the height of this thing would be 15 inches. This base down here would be 6 inches. This would be 2 inches in diameter. It would be a monster of a model for a 1 inch F15 telescope. <laughs> so I kind of, uh, my thinking evolved, shall we say. And I decided if I wanted a working telescope, I mean I could make a model of that scale and so forth. It'd be a horse of a model. But to make that work and get little tiny mirrors like that would be a pretty darn tricky situation. So that's how I ended up with this thing. And I decided that I could use uh, the mechanics, the axes from an existing mount, make a, a small coup de refractor like that. Not sure if it was really worth it, but that's, that's how this evolved. I may yet make one that looks much more like the original than this. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Stay tuned. Let me show you where this Coudé telescope came from. The mount uh, is basically a more or less generic mount from the 80s or 90s. This is almost identical to it. The castings are almost identical. It has an Orion name on it. I think if you look carefully at these two things, you can compare them and you can see that this is the same as that, but sort of inverted. I mean, I had to do some, I had to monkey around with this thing to make this able to be able to clear. And I thought seriously about mounting it in an upright fashion, but then you have yet another reflection. But the main problem was not so much that, it was the focal length here. If you're going to get that much focal length into this thing, you know, the actual objective is right about in here. So you got that much focal length. This thing has to have so much focal length. And if you start to um, shrink that distance, all of a sudden this becomes much more constrained. This, you know, I've got, uh, I think an inch and a quarter, no, inch and a half diagonal in here, an inch and a quarter diagonal down there. So uh, I've got, they're oversized. They're plenty adequate for, for the job. But if I had to put the, move this, uh, if I had to move the objective down to say here, 
then this has got to be bigger. So this is a two inch objective. So I've got to now have a, a much bigger construction down here. And it became too crowded. You couldn't do it. The, this down through here is uh, about an inch in diameter down through there. So it would not have worked with this particular objective. One of the things about this scope is you're looking through the eyepiece and this thing, if this thing moves like that, what you're going to see in the eyepiece is going to be strange. It's not at some weird, funny angle. It's completely non-intuitive, to say the least. So your motions are not at all obvious. Let's talk about collimation. First of all, I designed the scope so that you can remove the, the objective right there. Now, when I'm looking down through this thing, with no eyepiece here at least, I'm just seeing two mirrors, one in here and one over there. Turn this a little so you can see that. So I've got a couple of mirrors that I'm looking through, and I've got the three adjustment, kind of traditional adjustment screws for each of the mirrors. I found that the best way to do this is sort of backwards this way, uh, adjust this mirror so that I can see this mirror 100%, no vignetting, then adjust this mirror so that I can see this, cool, with no vignetting, then come around here, use this one, and it's going to require some more adjustment because you're going to tweak this a little bit so there's no vignetting, so you're looking straight down the, the tube at this mirror, and then you're looking at this mirror, and this mirror wants to see the telescope. So now you have to put on the telescope. So you want to make sure there's no vignetting. And then you get into the optical collimation. Then you use a, I use a, a bright light right here to optically collimate this as you would any refractor. You can, you can use the same basic techniques. You're going to tweak these little things. It's really not too terribly hard. The trick is to make sure that everything is unvignetted. And, um, and that you can get everything lined up so you have the optical axis just right. Now, one of the other tricks with this whole thing is this. When you move this thing, like so, there's a possibility that the mechanical and optical axes will not be perfectly on the same line. So you can uh, throw it off just a little bit. I'm lucky enough that with this scope, when I move it around, the optical axis and the mechanical axis are pretty close. So it works pretty well. Not bad. Uh, and of course, theoretically, you should tweak it every, <laughs> every time. I'm not going to be doing that, of course. You should tweak the uh, collimation every time. Uh, and of course, if you have a big Zeiss 6-inch telescope, I'm sure the mechanics and optics on that are going to be dead on, spot on perfect. But for an amateur telescope, that's a tricky thing to do. I'm going to take this apart and show you how it works. I have not lubricated this yet, so it's not greasy on the inside, but it'll soon be greasy. Uh, after I make this video, first thing we can do is remove those. Second, let's remove this. This is one of the folding mirrors. It's just a secondary, an old secondary from a Newtonian telescope. I think I'll move the other, remove the other one also just so you can see. This one is tight enough that I have to loosen the actual mirror in there, which is kind of a pain because then I have to readjust it. Of course I have to readjust it anyway every time I insert it. Um, those are just old Newtonian secondaries. I had to take this off and machine that, put threads on there, so that was a bit tricky. Taking this thing apart, by the way, was a real nightmare. This, things were epoxied together. It, it required a lot of uh, strength and ingenuity to get, to get all the pieces apart here. And of course this, to cut this is cut out of a cube of aluminum stock. That took a while. Okay, so this is um, 
Uh, you might call it a star diagonal. It's not really. It's got a, I should have the uh, counterweight on there. I should show you that. Anyway, uh, the objective and telescope tube slide right on here. So first thing to do is to remove this. I don't really have to take this all the way off, but I'll take it all the way off so you can see what's happening. Okay, so there's the worm gear. There's the worm gear it drives against. You can see that, I'm pretty sure. Okay, just basically cut that out, machine that out. This is pretty much, the way the original was made was like this. Um, I enlarged this hole here a little bit. But other than that, the basic construction here is the same. And of course, these are, this is all replacement parts, all different parts. I had to cut this gear off of uh, the original. Uh-oh. Don't use that. My set screw. Okay, so I just lost the set screw out of there. It's a tiny little double. Anyway, this goes on like that to hold it together. Then that has to be. I have to use the set screw to tighten that down. This is the... I wanted to show you this bearing again. Uh, this is... I had to epoxy this thing on there. I tried just friction. Friction wasn't enough to hold that. So I had to epoxy this gear onto this whole assembly here. Which is uh, very much like the original was made. Uh, except that... The, oh man, there was epoxy everywhere in that thing. I wanted to show you how this bearing... And notice I don't have the slow motion housing on there. This bearing, I, I tried to do the best I could with this thing to make this a good bearing. And it's, when you tighten it down, it's not bad. I don't know, it's probably, but see that little bit of wobble there? That little bit of, a little bit of wobble is not good. It's very obvious at the eyepiece. So, um, I don't know, I think I cut that within two thousandths, but it wasn't quite tight enough. <laughs> so even the cheap Chinese bearings are probably cut to a, a tolerance that's at least better than two thousandths, I would guess. Uh, it's also kind of a big bearing, it's hanging out there. You know, there's a lot of mass here hanging way out on the end of this thing. That's one of the problems with the this kind of telescope. The other problem is, um, if you look, you can see that you've got a nice big hole here. And this is bigger than it needs to be. This is actually an aperture stop here of about roughly an inch and a half or so. And um, so you need an inch and a half hole. You need a, a bigger secondary here than inch and a half because it's going to have you know, it's not going to hit dead on. One of the problems with this also is that the optics don't always quite line up with everything else. All right. So that pretty much gives you a sense of what's going on with that. That's one of the problems with these kudas is that, you know, all this stuff is way oversized for uh, it's a 50 millimeter telescope. Look at this. The secondary is huge. And the, you know, all the folding mirrors and the axes are gigantic and everything. So that's one of the difficulties with this kind of thing. 
I hope you've enjoyed having a look at this Coup Telescope. Thank you very much for watching.